Muslims don't care about other Muslims. Arabs don't care about other Arabs. Nobody cares about the Palestinians. Nobody cares about them. Can't tell you how little they care about them. Jordanians loathe them. The Egyptians loathe them. The Lebanese loathe them. They've done nothing for the Palestinians for 70 years. And yet, whenever the Israelis do anything, the Muslims across the West come out on the streets because they hate the Jews. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in Yemen. Not a peep on the streets of Britain and other places. Certainly not big protests. Uh, Bashar al-Assad has killed more Muslims in the last 10 years than, than everybody on every side killed in every war involving Israel since 1948, including the War of Independence. Nobody cares. The Muslims don't come out on the streets. They don't care. The only thing they care about is their hatred of the Jews. And it motivates them like nothing else because it hits at the core of their self-esteem. They can't bear it. And so that... You know, like you, Michael, I've been in this game for a while now. Um, but I think if you'd have said to me, if we'd have had a conversation even six months ago and you said an UNRWA employee will be caught with um, kidnapped Jews in their house... I'd have thought, well, that's going to be a bit much. Um, for UNRWA employees to be involved in the massacre. The one good thing of the last couple of days is that finally there has been that effect that we've talked about before, but that of more than just America noticing there's something rotten. In this, because occasionally America notices there's something rotten in these international institutions. Israel knows there is and, and suffers on the front line from this. But, but America occasionally will wake up to this. But others, European countries, you know, Norway, these sort of countries just keep funding them anyway because there's a sort of, well, you've got to give your money to someone <laughs> to do good in the world or feel you're doing good. And... Um, UNRWA is obviously the worst of them, but there are, there are, there are a lot of these UN institutions. Um, I was at a meeting with the families of the children hostages uh, in November with uh, UNICEF officials. And, you know, I mean, somebody said to one of the UNICEF officials, um, you know, UNICEF has one job, one job, to looking up, look after the welfare of children. And they did not bother for over a month to do anything about the kidnapped Jewish children. Nothing. As it turned out, the day that the uh, deputy head of UNICEF came to Jerusalem for that meeting, the head of UNICEF was in Cairo a couple of days earlier where she had a car crash. Not a very serious one, but she used this as an excuse not to come to Jerusalem. And it turned out during the meeting that she was actually in Gaza. And she was not there to look for the missing Jewish children. Um, so there is a profound rot and sickness at the heart of a number of these institutions. And it's, it's, it's a deep problem because people in this country know it, and my goodness, do we know it from the UNRWA case. But can we make the rest of the world understand that's going to be a great challenge? I mean, look at the case with education in general, what, whatever happens after the war in Gaza. Who but this country is going to do anything to make sure the textbooks aren't the same? Because when a few years ago it was decided to add the black and the brown stripes, which was a massive category error because it was suggested that without the black and the brown stripes, black and brown people weren't represented in the flag. Well, of course, like, who did they think the yellow stripes represented? Or, or the orange ones, or the red ones, or the blue ones? Like, was it the Smurfs? were represented or, or like, what, what, like people from Scotland when they've been in the sun a bit too long? Like, what did they think this, the, these stripes were uh, at the beginning? They weren't about race. So, of course, I really don't want to hear Allah Akbar shouted again on my streets. It's a war cry. The Hamas terrorists are shouting Allah Akbar all the way through, all the way through, as they are using a shovel to decapitate a young man. With every blow of the shovel, they shout Allah Akbar when they go in to rape and um, murder all these young women in a room. They're shouting Allah Akbar the whole time and they find a young woman hiding under a table, pretending to be dead and they realize she's alive and they begin killing her. They're shouting Allah Akbar all the time. And they're so elated. And they phone home. One disgusting young Hamas guy shouts, 
He shouts from the phone of one of his victims, his father in Gaza, saying, I have killed with my own hands 10 Jews. Your son has killed 10 Jews. And the mother is put on the phone and they're all shouting Allahu Akbar and they're so proud of him. Indescribable. So why, why just hope that those people are not in large enough numbers and keep your fingers crossed and put it off for another day? I think we have to start saying very clearly, if you don't like it here, go. Hamas and their friends are Nazis and we'll have to get rid of them. And the Israelis are doing a very good job in the beginning of that but everyone's going to have to join in. We cannot live with these people. We can't. Not because we don't want to, but because they cannot live with us. Sides of the aisle. Uh, you have Donald Trump who will be approaching his 80s if he was to uh, get re-election. Uh, you have Biden who's already there and would be in his mid 80s uh, by the time of a second term. Uh, you have all these senior figures in the Senate on both sides of the aisle uh, um, Diane Feinstein most recently wheeled in on a wheelchair at the age of 89 into the Senate, a dem very distinguished Democrat senator. But there's something very odd about the gerontocracy of American politics. It doesn't exist in Australia. It doesn't exist in Britain. It, it's a phenomenon of, of, of American politics in recent years. And that's why I say in that column in the Telegraph that what would really be interesting for this race is not to remain with the gerontocracy race with you know Biden versus Trump again, but go down a generation in both parties. If you look at both a war on everything to do with the foundations of the West, everything to do with the results of the Western inheritance. Um, and, and when I say that, of course, I mean the war as I do it bit by bit on Western history, a war on Western peoples, a war on Western culture, uh, war on Western religion and philosophy. This uh, position that I argue that we've come to in the present age where everything is bad if it came from us, let, let me say, us in the West, and everything is good so long as it hasn't come from us. Now, I should stress, by the way, that what I'm describing here is Western anti-Westernism. Uh, there are plenty of other forms of anti-Westernism. Um, there's a Russian anti-Westernism, there's Chinese anti-Westernism, all sorts of other kinds. But the one that I think is most interesting, partly because it's so pathological, is what I'm really writing about here, which is Western anti-Westernism. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed those video vignettes of what I call Douglas Murrayisms, the best of. You've been watching the Dr. Nasser Shake Show. I've been your host, Dr. Nasser, and if you haven't done so already, we'd love for you to subscribe to our channel, like, share, and follow us. Put your comments down below. Let us know what you think. I'll leave you with my final thought, which is, when you're right, you're right, and when you're left, you're wrong. Until next time, folks, take care and stay safe.